You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. In this series, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss one of the major challenges of our time, that's climate change. What are the facts behind climate change? What will be the impact of our evolving climate and how can businesses prepare? Joining me today is Dr. Joel Myers, the founder and chief executive officer of AccuWeather. Joel is considered the father of modern commercial meteorology and is the nation's most respected authority on the business of meteorology. He also serves as a trustee of the Committee for Economic Development, which is the public policy center of the conference board. Joel, welcome to the program. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So, Joel, a meteorologist is a scientist and, you know, someone who studies and works in the in the field, obviously, aiming to understand or predict the Earth's atmospheric phenomena, including weather. Now, you're in your 60th year of leading AccuWeather. You founded it. You know, you've you've uh, housed uh, all of the, the institute at uh, Penn State. You taught. But take us back to the beginning. Why did you found AccuWeather and how has your work changed the science of meteorology? Well, thanks, Dave. So I uh, grew up in Philadelphia, and uh, when I was three years old, I fell in love with snow. And uh, <laughs> by the time I was seven, uh, my grandmother gave me a, a diary to keep uh, to write down the days when it snowed, and I kept uh, doing a daily diary of weather conditions. Uh, I was entrepreneurial as, as a kid. I grew up in a household, so if you didn't have much money, but there was talk of uh, people who were successful. So I guess I had the entrepreneurial spirit at an early age. I had a paper route. I was looking to earn money in different areas uh, to support my coin collecting hobby. And uh, when I was 11, my father showed me an article of a meteorologist, a very enterprising meteorologist in Boston, who was actually selling forecasts to fuel oil dealers to help them operate more efficiently. And I said, boy, that would be the ideal thing for me to combine my burning desire to be a weather forecaster with my entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, so I continued to uh, study weather, uh, even in high school. I think I had my 10,000 hours in by the time I went off to Penn State. And that was a blessing. So it turned out the only college or university I could afford was Penn State. It was the state university. And it turned out they had the best meteorological program in the world. So I not only got a great education, but great mentorship. And uh, so I got three degrees there, my bachelor's, master's, and PhD, taught for 21 years, the basic course in forecasting. But uh, the professor who uh, later became department head, Dr. Charles Hosler, knew of my dream. And uh, the local gas company called him while I was a second year graduate student and wanted somebody to provide forecasts. Uh, that were accurate day by day, five days out. And so he said, I'm just the man for you. He gave me the number to call on the back of a ripped envelope. I called. They paid me $50 a month for uh, three and a half winter months. AccuWeather had $175 in annual revenue, and we were off and running. Wow. What You know, Joel, it's so inspiring to listen to your story because you you are the great American ex- success story. Not only you know, in what you've accomplished from a business perspective, but what you've contributed to society. I just can't imagine where we would be today if we didn't have AccuWeather and, uh, you know, all, all of the, the forecasts and, and right at our fingertips, you know, on our, on our cell phones uh, every day. So thank, I, you know, we should start by saying thank you uh, for all that you've done. Well, you're welcome. And it's been uh, a very gratifying to me building a team and making a uh, building on obviously the scientific progress uh, through better models and better understanding of atmospheric physics and all of that, but taking uh, the data and the model output and making them, uh, first of all, providing forecasts that are more accurate, but more localized, more specific, but in language that people and companies can understand and in ways they can make the best decision 
uh, to keep their employees safer, to keep families safer, uh, to reduce losses. And, uh, you know, we've saved over 10,000 lives, uh, prevented uh, injury to uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, obviously saved companies well over $100 billion in the 60 years we've been in business. So uh, I'm blessed to have a team that's been able to create that kind of legacy for us. And clearly a, a great value. You are a meteorologist, not a climatologist, and there is a difference. But, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the weather today and, and, and the impact of uh, the change in climate on the weather and, you know, what's going on is, is in every newspaper. It's, it's uh, being debated in the halls of Congress and, you know, across the country. We all know that weather is variable and has been since the earth was cooled and the climate's in constant state of change. But talk about how the climate is changing now versus historically and how much of the variability do we see is, is really driven by mankind? Well, that's quite a mouthful. And as you said, I am a uh, meteorologist, not a climatologist. So uh, I, it's necessary to uh, uh, make that clear. Uh, we specialize in, in weather forecasts, uh, particularly over the next 90 days and providing warnings and uh, detail that's not available from others. And we've had so many recent successes with Hurricane Eon, and Irma, and snowstorms and the tornado in Texas on uh, Sunday, where we provide greater notice, more accurate information, more detail to uh, uh, help people. And that's been what we've been all about. But I'm happy to answer your, uh, or try to answer your question about uh, climate. So the world's climate, uh, of course, has changed sometimes dramatically since the beginning of time, the beginning of when the earth was created. Uh, we know that uh, through most of world history, if you go back millions of years, uh, the average was somewhat warmer than it is today. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, we're coming out of an ice age. There was actually four advances and retreats of the ice over the last couple of million years. The last of these four uh, reached a max of about 15,000 years ago. And even 10, 12,000 years ago, the ice was two and a half miles thick over Montreal. The southern edge of the ice uh, uh, brought those rocks to Central Park. And obviously, in that period, it was a lot colder. But the temperature has been warming up naturally uh, as we come out of that ice age for thousands of years. But Steve, I should also mention that clearly humans are contributing to the global warming that is occurring by burning fossil fuels. CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a long time. And as I mentioned, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere is higher than it's been uh, in a long time. Methane it actually is more of a greenhouse gas than CO2, but it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long, so that can be reversed. What greenhouse gases do, they act like a greenhouse, uh, which the sunlight comes through the glass, uh, accumulates in the greenhouse, but the hot air doesn't escape. So when you compare the temperature on the Earth to the temperature on the moon, keep in mind the average distance of the moon and the Earth is the same from the sun. The distance from the moon to the sun and the Earth to the sun on average is the same. So the temperature should be about the same, but it's really about 20 to 30 degrees warmer on the Earth because of the greenhouse effect, which existed you know, long before humans appeared on the Earth. But, and so there's always been that effect, but it's been intensified uh, by these greenhouse gases. But let's talk about what the threat of global warming is to humanity. Some of the threats have been overstated. I'm a scientist, and scientific progress is accelerating faster than ever before in human history. And I'm an optimist. So uh, I believe that uh, we will solve carbon capture. We will bring hydrogen power on. Uh, we're not just going to be dependent on windmills and solar, although of those two, solar probably has the most potential. But also fission. Nuclear power is being made more efficient, less risky. Clearly, while there's no greenhouse gas emissions at all from nuclear power plants, there is radioactive waste 
which uh, some people are concerned about, and rightly so. But a lot of breakthroughs are occurring there, and nuclear power will be part of the future. But the real ultimate elusive fusion will be the winner. And it could be 10 years off, it could be longer, but eventually humans will solve fusion. And once they do, power will be almost free. I remember uh, back in the 1970s when we used Watts lines and it cost me, even with Watts lines, 50 cents a minute to call California. And I, and I read an article in The Economist that said, in 20 years, phone calls will be free. And they virtually are today. The same thing will be true of power in the net within the next uh, 50 years, and perhaps much less than that because of these breakthroughs. Uh, I believe the cost of energy will come down dramatically over the next uh, 10 to 30 years. So wouldn't it be a great world if energy was almost free and no greenhouse gases were put into the atmosphere? I believe that may occur uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. Yeah, and it's interesting. It, the variability has been you know, pretty dramatic, as you said, two and a half miles thick ice sheet. And then you know, they, they're finding fossilized ferns on the North Pole. So our, our Earth has been through a lot of different change you know, in, in climate and weather over time. I, and I completely understand that obviously that, that mankind has contributed to this, but, but you wonder sometimes these forces, you know, you'd only have to study astronomy and, you know, the, the physics of it in the, the forces of the sun and uh, the wobble and the earth's access, all, all, all of these things contribute to, to this variability. And I, I just remember back in the sixties, you know, when we were talking about chlorofluorocarbons, we were talking about CO2 emissions and, you know, punching an ozone Pole and uh, uh, at the poles, and all of that was going to create an ice age. Well, and I, don't think, I don't think that was going to create the ice age. And, and the, the core of Farben, uh, and I never can, uh, it's a complicated word that I never pronounce exactly right, but that was a real threat. Uh, the ozone hole uh, to health because uh, the skin cancer uh, really spiked. Uh, and skin cancer risk is much higher, you know, today in southern Chile and southern Argentina. And the closer you get to uh, to Antarctica, where the ozone hole is, and, and uh, there's 1.2 million deaths a year due to melanoma, a much higher incidence the closer you are to Antarctica. Uh, but but humans got together and have made a lot of progress. So the ozone layer has been repairing itself because uh, there was universal agreement that was a serious problem. And uh, because, you know, all the ozone taken down to sea level is only a fraction of an inch thick and it protects us uh, from harmful uh, X-rays and ultraviolet rays and so on. So that was a big success story. But the, the, there was talk in the 70s about another ice age, the Ewing Don theory and so on, because we went through some very harsh and cold winters. But that was not that was extreme, obviously, and uh, was something I remember. It got a lot of fanfare when it was on the cover of Time and Newsweek uh, in the late seventies, and we had some extremely cold winters. Let's face it; the weather can be very, very. Even though the trend uh, is for warming temperatures, doesn't mean we can't have record snows and very cold periods. The, 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 in 150, 160 years, the biggest. Uh, heaviest snowfall in one winter, a record going up in Philadelphia. I never thought we'd ever see that much snow. Broke previous records by, I think it was 18 or 20 inches. It was by far the snowiest winter probably since Ben Franklin was in Philadelphia, maybe before, <laughs> and that just happened about 10 years ago. So yeah, there's a lot of variability still is, and it's not, everything's not going to just turn warm and all snow is going to disappear you know, in 10 or even a hundred years. Yeah. And, and so this, you know, this comes down to the point where people are, are talking about climate change and, and, you know, the weather patterns being settled science. And that, that always bothers me because, you know, settled science seems like an oxymoron, but, you know, by definition, the scientific method is constantly testing and, and constantly challenging theories and so forth. But, you know, I, I just think it's so important that we continue to bring the facts forward on this and really, truly understand, as you have and as you do, 
regularly bring the facts forward so that people you know truly understand the variability of weather and the and the massive forces that are at work here. Well, that's right. But let me talk a little bit about prediction. Part of the reason that I and AccuWeather have been successful is uh, we spent a lot of time studying the art, the science, uh, and the theory of prediction. Let me give you some examples if you would let me. So most of the information we consume is what happened or what is happening right now. But once you venture into making a forecast, there's uncertainty. And uh, what we've done is saying, okay, well, we are making a forecast. How's it going to look 24 hours or seven days after the fact? How do we maximize credibility and trust? How do we emphasize what we're sure about and leave open through our wording the uncertainty that's there, but indicate how that will evolve, how the forecast will evolve? That's very important to build trust and then to be able, as you say, new facts can become available. Now, if we can, like we did in New York City, uh, I'll toot our horn a little bit, there was a snowstorm last winter, eight to 12 inches of snow. Uh, we put the accumulation of eight to 12, it was actually nine to 12, I guess, if you measured the actual amounts across the city, but we put an accumulation in of eight to 12 inches, 24 hours before any other forecasters. And then different models came in and, uh, said uh, in one case, the snow would miss. And so some of our competitors took all mention of snow out. And then another model came in and showed there'd be 18 inches. And so, uh, uh, so another forecaster said, oh, 12 to 18. But we kept eight to 12 throughout and it was nine to 12. There's all kinds of procedures and so on we go through to do that, but that builds trust. That builds faith. And so people will make the right decision. And part of its communication, like with Hurricane Irma heading to New York, we said, uh, uh, this rain's gonna come in fast and furious. It's going to cause lethal flooding uh, and so on. It shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. So uh, there's a whole science to that. The CDC didn't realize they were making forecasts. When, when COVID first appeared, there was a lot of uncertainty, but they kept making definitive statements. Uh, some of it was definitive, but some of it should have been, they should have left it open so they could update and evolve. So by the end of the uh, epidemic, and <clears throat> some people claim we're still in it, but uh, it certainly makes a lot of progress. But by the end, they lost a lot of credibility. They have nowhere near the trust they did before the event. So we've done the opposite in building trust for weather forecasting. What that does, when people hear our forecast, they will more likely to make the right decision to believe in it, to not no lack of false alarms, crying wolf. Uh, there's a whole uh, psychology I could talk all day about about it, and sometimes that communication of a forecast, the, since it is a forecast and there's uncertainty, will uh, the communications is as important as getting the numbers right so people understand it and make the right decision. Now, sometimes you can be dramatic. I mean, uh, I've gone on the air in the past and AccuWeather does there's an absolutely no chance of rain tomorrow. <clears throat> we'll stake our life on it. And there are days you can do that. And that gets people to sit up and take notice. So there are ways that you can build trust, but it's important not to lose that trust because then who knows when if you can ever get it back. We're talking with Dr. Joel Myers about the science behind the weather, forecasting, climate change. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended original expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the conference board has always done, we are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Visit us at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Then on November 29th, join us for a live virtual briefing from our economists and other financial experts it's complimentary to you and your colleagues. 
Register now on our website to hear the latest on weathering this economic turbulence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dr. Joel Myers, the founder and CEO of AccuWeather. So, Joel, we, we were talking before the break and, you know, the, the, the difficulty of forecasting, but also the science behind it and the importance of building trust. Uh, have you found that uh, that weather and the climate is is cyclical over time? And, you know, is it tied to, you know, functions like the, the sunspot cycle and some of these things that that allow you to forecast better? Well, we don't use sunspot cycles so uh, much, but uh, clearly there are. Uh, cycles uh, of everything, uh, the pulsations and so on. And we know that there are a, a sequence of years where there are lots of hurricanes tied to uh, the distribution of temperatures, in different parts of the oceans of the world and so on. There are all kinds of hundreds of factors. But and then there you get a series of snowy winters and you get a, a series of record heat in the Pacific Northwest and uh, droughts and then heavy rain and all these things run in cycles of different lengths. And uh, it's a mistake uh, talking about credibility. And we do now provide forecasts out to 2100 for based on the climate model so companies can prepare uh, for extremes. For example, uh, I'll give you one uh, that we developed. So right now, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but Right now, let's say in Phoenix, Arizona, there are two days on an average summer where the temperature is 115 degrees. Well, if it's 115, your air conditioning bill is going to go through the roof and you're not going to be want to be outside. But because of global warming, what if I told you in 2050, there'll be 24 of those days? Well, I may not want to move my plant or my business to Phoenix because workers are not going to be productive and they're Nobody wants to go outside that many days. So uh, the climate change will have an impact and we can help companies that way. But there's a lot unknown. Uh, and there's uh, obviously, uh, that's why people have to check the weather forecast, have to check AccuWeather because it changes. You know, the weather may be 75 one day and 45 the next. Yeah, it's absolutely correct. You know, uh, four years ago, the, the United Nations came out with a special report that says that we've got 12 years to head off uh, a climate calamity. And, and you know, they're talking about this uh, two degrees Celsius uh, raise in temperature and that, you know, everybody needs to band together around the globe to to deal with this. And and, you know, the United States is is trying to react here and to and to spending money. And and uh, obviously the, the green objectives have been have been set. But talk about talk about this, because it 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 is uh, it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of change that would need to be happening. But if we just do it in the United States, it's not going to be enough, is it? Because, you know, you really you got to get everybody else around the globe to uh, to play in this, too. Oh, you're right. It's one atmosphere. And, uh, uh, you know, if the United States does it and nobody else does, conceivably, it could put us at a disadvantage and the whole world will uh, suffer uh, as a result. Listen, as the earth warms, there's going to be winners and losers. Uh, there are places in the world where in the summer, like I mentioned, Phoenix, uh, in the Middle East and so on, where the temperature's 120, 122 degrees, it's at the level, if it gets much higher, people can't survive. So there are places that if, if the temperature gets much above in the summer where it is, people will have to leave or die. Uh, it's also going to affect crops in different places, there'll be winners, there'll be losers. It's not, so the whole world may lose, but uh, some will lose more than others. Uh, the fact is though, you can't deny that the uh, humans have flourished over the last 10,000 years, particularly over the last 1,000 years, and most, most over the last 500 as science has helped uh, humanity, but it's been in a relatively cold period of the Earth's history. So it's interesting to look at that as well. Yeah, and uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of countries act here. You saw the you know the Paris Climate Accord, but at the same time, you've got China and India, you know, adding coal-fired plants. I think China has added 43 coal-fired plants in the last year, 18 coal-fired blast furnaces. You know, China, India, Indonesia, all of these account for more than 80 percent of the coal. So 
you know, that's contributing to the CO2 and so forth. So this comes back to the notion of, you know, one atmosphere, we, we share it and it, it has to be done in a correlated fashion. How, you know, so how are you seeing that? And, you know, what are the best avenues in your opinion to, you know, to get consensus and action on this? Well, now you're asking a totally political question in international diplomacy. And so that's not my field. I think you ought to get some other people to interview on that. Yeah. Your point, though, was that it is one atmosphere and there does, you know, it, it's not going to help if just one little one little part, you know, does something and the rest don't, obviously. Yeah, that, that is the point. And also, I want to make a point that I don't know about that. So I'm not going to comment on it. Too many people today, uh, because they're an expert in one area, I think they're so smart, they can make opinions on everything. And, I, and maybe I'll make it statistical, too. But I, I think we all need to recognize what we can talk intelligently about and what we ought to defer to other people who really have more knowledge than, than we do. Yeah, well put. You know, you t- you were talking about temperature. You used uh, Arizona as, as an example of, uh, you know, temperature, but there's there's also water in, involved with this. And that's water is pretty important to human life and obviously the growth of crops. And, and, and so the temperature and the weather change and variability has affected water uh, at the same time. So there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of interconnected variables here. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, uh, we're more dependent, the uh, more people on the planet than ever by far. I, you know, in my lifetime, the population of the, of the planet has tripled. Uh, so we have to grow more food. We've built more cities. Uh, we're using more energy. We're cutting down more trees, which absorb CO2. And, and uh, paving over uh, places, even that uh, makes it warmer. When you have a forest and the sun's rays are distributed through the forest of a hundred feet canopy, and there's moisture on the forest floor that uh, you you know if that causes heat to evaporate, and you replace that with a field, you cut down all the trees. All the sun's rays and energy are concentrated at the surface, uh, so it's going to be warmer. Uh, now, the atmosphere as a whole won't be, but at the surface it will be. Uh, and then you go to the next step and you put concrete and buildings which absorb the heat and hold it longer and make it even hotter. So these are all factors. And, and now we're more dependent on uh, supply chain and, and uh, where the food's grown and get it to everybody. And water is part of that, using up all the water that was available because we need it for crops, we need it for drinking, we need it for washing our cars and watering our lawns and all those things. Uh, all these factors are at play. So they're all interconnected. And if we you know, add another two, three, four billion people to the population of the world in the next hundred years or so, um, it, it's, it's going to put stress on just by that. Absolutely well spoken. You know, so a- as you advise your clients and, you know, essentially from a, a planning standpoint, you've mentioned going out uh, a very long period of time uh, in your forecasting. What are you telling businesses to do? How are you, how are you advising them to plan for eventual change? Well, it depends what their issue is, uh, what they want to know. You know, we, they come to us with an issue and uh, we work with them to what parameters are important or they have a plan along a river and they're concerned the river level will rise a, a foot and a half and flood the plant. Uh, should they invest in that plant? Should they move, as I said, to a place that's cold, or, or should somebody uh, build a ski area downwind of Lake Superior? Because uh, if Lake Superior is going to be less frozen in the winter, there's going to be twice as much snow there. I mean, it, it's you can imagine all kinds of long-term planning, but most of our clients, most of our business is still in providing very detailed forecasts for their needs so that it will answer their ultimate question. People, companies, people want the weather forecast so they will make better decisions about their life, their activities, their travel, uh, the business decisions, shipping, uh, receiving, uh, demand, all kinds of uh, things. We work for most of the transportation companies in North America, retail, uh, every kind of business, insurance and so on. So each business has different issues and problems and we help them identify how the weather and the weather forecast first by de- developing the algorithms based on what's happened in the past and then helping them make better decisions 
than they've ever made before. Yeah, and some the of these projects like are bespoke projects, but you have a lot of information, a lot of forecasts that can be accessed right on your website um, at AccuWeather.com. But we have, yeah, but far more. We have tremendous amounts of data, historical data, uh, down to a kilometer for the world, uh, 130 different parameters. Uh, we have such the greatest collection of historical data so that all kinds of correlations can be run. And then you, from those developing algorithms, then use our forecast to project whatever it is, absenteeism, uh, sickness, or uh, time to whatever a company wants to figure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and the science behind all of this is just, is, it's just, uh, you know, it, very, very incredible. Joel, you, to be congratulated, you know, you were, uh, and you know, back way back 60 years ago, founding this organization and advancing the science of weather and the importance, you know, you just scratched the surface in terms of the importance to. I've never been more excited. We're constantly coming up with new ideas, new products. It's a, a joy to come to work every day and work with this uh, incredibly talented team and uh, with their innovations. And, uh, you know, we're just, uh, uh, we're just having a lot of fun and uh, excited about uh, what we're going to accomplish in the next month and the next two years. Dr. Joel Myers, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. I've enjoyed it, Steve. Thanks for all those good questions. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues because I know they're going to want to listen too. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation since our founding in 1916. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can find the latest and most trusted insights for what's ahead on our website. Please join us on November 29th for a live global virtual briefing from our award-winning economists and other financial experts. Get the latest thinking in how to best weather the economic turbulence by registering for this free briefing at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.